So today we're going to be solving October, November 2021, paper 12. Okay. Question number one says, Compound X consists of 40% carbon, 6.7% hydrogen, and 53.3% oxygen by mass. What is the empirical formula of compound X? So now let's say that you had 100 grams. Out of 100 grams, okay, out of 100 grams, carbon has a mass of 40 grams, okay? Hydrogen would have a mass of 6.7 grams and oxygen would have a mass of 53.3 grams. Okay, this is the mass ratio for these three elements in this compound. Now remember for the empirical formula, we want the atomic ratio or the molar ratio, right? So we're going to divide the masses by their, by the relative atomic masses. So for carbon, that would be 40 divided by 12. 40 divided by 12 is 3.33, right? This is M over MR, right? This is giving us the number of moles or M over A or other, right? Then for hydrogen, that'll be 6.7 divided by one. So that's 6.7. And then for oxygen, it's 53.3 divided by 16, which comes out to 3.33. So this is their molar ratio, right? These are their molar ratio. Now we're just gonna divide by the smallest number because we want one and numbers larger than one. So if we divide everything by 3.33, we get the ratio one is to two is to one. So our formula is CH2O. So the answer over here is A. Okay, the answer is A. Which statement is correct? One gram of hydrogen gas contains three times 10 to the power of 23 atoms. If you look at hydrogen, hydrogen has an MR of two grams per mole, right? It has a molar mass of two grams per mole. So the MR is two. So that means if I have one gram, right? I mean, the number of moles is 0 0.5 moles. So I have 0 0.5 moles of H2 gas. That means I have one mole of hydrogen atoms, right? Because each molecule has two atoms. So if I have half a mole of hydrogen gas, that means I have one mole of atoms. One mole of atoms is six times 10 to the power of 23. So that's not it, right? Four grams of helium gas contains 1.2 times 10 to the power of 24. If you look at helium, right? A molecule of helium is just He, right? And obviously, the relative atomic mass or the MR for this is equal to four, right? So that means if I have four grams, that means the number of moles I have is one mole. And one mole of helium gas would just be six times 10 to the power of six times 10 to the power of 23 atoms again. So the answer is not B either. 16 grams of methane gas contains this many atoms, three times 10 to the power of 24. Now, if you look at methane, methane is CH4, right? And for CH4, the MR is equal to 16. Now, the MR is 16, so that means the number of moles is 16 divided by 16, right? That's the mass divided by the MR, which is one mole. So we have one mole of CH4. So each molecule of CH4, how many atoms does it contain? How many atoms does it contain? or each molecule of CH4 has five atoms. Each molecule of methane has five atoms, one carbon atom and four hydrogen atoms. So that means one mole of CH4 will have five, five moles of atoms, right? For every molecule, for every molecule, we have five atoms. So one mole of this molecule, of these molecules will have five moles of atoms, which is five times six times 10 to the power of 23, okay? And that comes out to three times 10 to the power of 24 atoms. So the answer over here is C. Technetium is a second row transition element that does not na occur naturally on Earth. One of its isotopes has 56 neutrons. What is the nucleon number of this isotope? So if you look in the periodic table, okay, technetium has the atomic number 43. So if you're looking at this particular isotope, it had 43 protons. It has 43 protons, right? That's the element technetium. And it has 56 neutrons. So what's the nucleon number? The nucleon number, right, or the mass number is? the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So that's 43 plus 56. So the answer over here is C, which is 99, okay? This particular isotope has 99 neutrons, 43 protons and 56 neutrons. Which atom has more unpaired electrons than paired electron and orbitals of principal quantum number two? In other words, in sh uh, the question is asking, in shell number two, which atom has more unpaired electrons than paired electrons? Okay. Now carbon ends with carbon ends with 2s2 
टू पी टू टू एस टू टू पी टू राइट नाउ इफ यू लुक एट टू एस टू टू पी टू हाउ मेनी पेड इलेक्ट्रॉन्स इस कार्बन हैव हाउ मेनी पेड इलेक्ट्रॉन्स इन द सेकेंड शेल कार्बन हैज टू पेड इलेक्ट्रॉन्स राइट इट हैज टू पेड इलेक्ट्रॉन्स इन द टू एस ऑर्बिटल एंड इट हैज टू अनपेड इलेक्ट्रॉन्स इट हैज टू अनपेड इलेक्ट्रॉन्स इन द टू पी ऑर्बिटल राइट so it it has an equal number of paired and unpaired electrons in shell number 2 what about nitrogen nitrogen is 2s2 2p3 right nitrogen is 2s2 2p3 is group 15 five outer electrons does it have more unpaired electrons than paired electrons if you look at nitrogen it has three unpaired electrons and just two paired electrons so the answer over here is b okay nitrogen has nitrogen has more unpaired electrons than paired electrons for oxygen one of them will pair up right it's 2p4 So now you're gonna have four paired electrons and two unpaired, okay? And for fluorine, you'll just have one unpaired, okay? So the answer over here is B, all right? Atom X is the central atom in a molecule. In this molecule, atom X has four pairs of valence electrons in its outer shell. The four pairs of valence electrons include at least one bond pair and at least one lone pair. What could be a possible shape for the molecule? Over here, they're saying atom X in the molecule has four pairs of valence electrons. The central atom in a molecule, okay, it has four pairs of valence electrons after it's made those bonds, right? After, after it's bonded to the other atoms and everything. Now it has a total of eight valence electrons, okay, in the molecule itself. From those four pairs, you at least have one lone pair. You have at least one lone pair, and you have at least one bond, right? So now, right now, we just have two pairs of electrons. We need a total of four pairs of electrons. Now, one possibility that we have is this. One possibility that we have is this guy over here, right? This possibility would be three pairs of three bonded pairs and one lone pair. That would be four pairs of valence electrons. This shape would be what? This shape would be trigonal pyramidal. But that's not an option here. The other possibility that we have is we have we have two lone pairs like this, and we have two bond pairs. What would this shape be? This shape over here is called bent, right? It's called bent. It's also called angular, and it's also called non-linear. Okay. Is that a possibility here? Yes. The answer over here is B. Right. The shape could be could be non-linear. Okay. Now again, under this is this is what's similar to ammonia, right? You have four valence, four pairs of valence electrons, right? Four bond, and one of them is a lone pair, and you have three bonded pairs, right? Whereas this is similar to water, okay. Understand that this is not a possibility. This is not a possibility, okay. This would be a linear molecule, but it's not a central atom. For a central atom, you need to have at least you need to have at least three different atoms over here, okay. If you just have a diatomic molecule, then it's no longer a central atom. So this possibility doesn't exist. All right. So the answer is B. Which molecule has the largest overall dipole? In other words, which molecule has the largest net dipole, right? Now, if you look at the first molecule, does it have a net dipole? The first molecule does not have a net dipole, right? The two CLs and the two CLs on the right and the left cancel each other out, right? So what we have is we have we have four polar bonds, but it's not a polar molecule. All the net dipoles cancel each other out, so there's no net dipole. Okay. What about B? Does B have a net dipole? B does have a net dipole, right, towards the oxygen, because the oxygen is delta minus, right, and the carbon is delta plus, right. What about C? C also has a net dipole, but which net dipole is bigger? Do you think the net dipole in B is bigger or the net dipole in C? The net dipole in B is bigger, right? In C, you have the same thing. You have a delta minus oxygen, but you also have delta minus chlorine. So what's happening is you have a little bit of movement towards the chlorine, and you have movement towards the oxygen. So the overall net dipole is very small. Because the chlorines are sort of competing with the oxygen, the oxygen is still stronger, but it's not as much as in B, where the hydrogen can't really compete with the oxygen. Okay, so the answer over here is B, because chlorine is much more electronegative than hydrogen. It also withdraws a little bit towards itself, so oxygen can't withdraw as much. Okay, towards itself. Over here, oxygen is pretty much has no competition for these electrons. Okay, and D again, you don't have a net dipole, right? Carbon dioxide, the dipoles cancel each other out. Okay, so there's no net dipole here either. Okay, so the answer can't be D. So the answer is B. 
the strength of hydrogen bonding increases as the electronegativity of the element bonded to hydrogen increases. Some information for a range of hydrides is given. Which statement and reason about these hydrides is correct? The boiling point of pH 3 is much lower than the boiling point of H2O because pH 3 is phosphine does not form hydrogen bonds or instantaneous dipole induced dipole forces between its molecules. Is this correct? No. If they are just restricted to hydrogen bonds, that would be correct. pH 3 does not form hydrogen bonds. However, it does all simple molecules will have instantaneous dipole induced dipole forces of attraction. Okay, these attraction will exist between all simple molecules. So this is not true. The boiling point of HF is higher than the boiling point of HCl because the bond energy of HF is greater than the bond energy of HCl. Does bond energy play a role in boiling points for simple molecules? No, for simple molecules, it's intermolecular forces, not bond energies, right? Bond energy has to do with reactivity, how easily the bond breaks, right? Or thermal decomposition of hydrogen halides. We don't really talk about, we don't talk about bond energy when we're talking about boiling points, right? Boiling point and melting point for simple molecules are determined by intermolecular forces. The boiling point of H2O is higher than the boiling point of HF because each hydrogen bond between the H2O molecules is stronger than each hydrogen bond between HF molecules. Is each hydrogen bond stronger than H2O than in HF? Do you think? No. HF actually has stronger hydrogen bonds, but it just has one. Water has two hydrogen bonds. That's why waters is higher. Okay, it has to do with the number of hydrogen bonds. HF fluorine is more electronegative than oxygen, so that's not true. HF would have stronger hydrogen bonds based on that. Okay, the boiling points of phosphine and HCl are similar because the molecules of pH three and HCl have the same number of electrons and similar intermolecular forces. And that obviously we know that this must be the right answer, right? Because because what we have is we've eliminated the other three, but Phosphine over here has 15 plus 3 electrons, okay, this is 18 electrons, and HCl has 17 plus 1, which is again 18 electrons, okay. And they're both polar molecules, so they both have van der Waals due to instantaneous dipole induced dipoles, and they also have van der Waals used to due to permanent dipole, permanent dipole interactions, and both of them don't show hydrogen bonding, okay. For hydrogen bonding, hydrogen has to be bonded to, hydrogen has to be bonded to an oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine. So both of them have instantaneous induced dipole interactions and permanent dipole interactions since they're both polar molecules. So the answer here is D. Question number eight. The general gas equation can be used to calculate the value of the MR of a gas. For a sample of gas of mass m grams, which expression will give the value of the MR? Well, we know that the ideal gas equation is PV is equal to nRT, right? And here n is obviously just that's the mass divided by the molar mass, so mass over MR, okay, times RT, right? So then what is the MR? So that tells us that the MR, okay, is equal to MRT divided by PV. So the answer over here is A, right? The MR is equal to MRT over PV. The equation for the formation of ammonium chloride is shown. Which diagram shows the correctly labeled reaction pathway for the decomposition of ammonium chloride? To talk about the decomposition of ammonium chloride, you're talking about the backward reaction. To talk about the decomposition, you're talking about the backward reaction. And the enthalpy change for the backward reaction will be positive 314 kilojoules per mole, right? This is for the forward reaction is negative 314. Decomposition would be NH4Cl breaking up into NH3 and HCl. So, first of all, can it be option C or D at all? Is it an endothermic reaction in C and D? No, right? So we can eliminate C and D. We can eliminate C and D because it's an endothermic reaction, the decomposition reaction. So then, which one is it for the decomposition over here? Is it A or is it B? The enthalpy change is endothermic, right? So that's, that's this. But what about the activation energy? What's the activation energy here? Is it A? Or is it D? It's from the reactants all the way to the top, right? So the activation energy over here is correctly shown in B. So the answer here is B. Okay, the activation energy is incorrectly shown in A. All right. In a catalytic converter in the exhaust system of a car, carbon monoxide is oxidized to carbon dioxide 
and nitrogen monoxide is reduced to nitrogen. What are the changes in oxidation number of carbon and nitrogen in these two processes? So when carbon monoxide is oxidized to carbon dioxide, right? The change in oxidation number over here is in carbon monoxide, carbon is simply plus two, right? Because, because oxygen is negative two. And in carbon dioxide, oxygen is minus two over here. So you have two times minus two for the two oxygens. That's negative four. So carbon is plus four. The change in oxidation number over here is plus two, right? We're going from plus two to plus four. And if you talk about nitrogen monoxide to nitrogen, nitrogen monoxide to nitrogen, right? In nitrogen monoxide, nitrogen is positive two since oxygen is negative two, okay? And in elemental nitrogen, nitrogen is zero, right? Because in element, standard elements, the oxidation number is zero, right? So in the elemental form. So then we know that we're going from plus two to zero. So the change over here is minus two. So for carbon, the change is plus two, right? From carbon monoxide to carbon dioxide. And for nitrogen, the change is negative two. So the answer over here is, D. All right. Nitrogen monoxide and nitrogen dioxide are both present in the lower atmosphere as pollutants. The reaction sequence shows the production of ozone from oxygen in the lower atmosphere. This sequence repeats many times. Which statement about this reaction sequence is correct? The first statement says NO is acting as a catalyst, but NO2 is not acting as a catalyst. Now, first of all, is this true or not? We can clearly see that nitrogen monoxide is acting as a catalyst. Now, understand that this sequence of reaction is happening multiple, multiple times. Okay, so what's happening over here is if you look at if, for example, if this reaction were to happen first, right, and then it was followed by reaction, it was followed by this reaction over here, right, then we can see that NO would be acting as a catalyst because nitrogen monoxide will help produce nitrogen dioxide. Nitrogen dioxide would help produce nitrogen monoxide again and then oxygen atoms and then oxygen atoms would react to form ozone, right? So if, if for since these reactions are constantly repeating themselves, right? Nitrogen dioxide is constantly being generated by nitrogen monoxide and then nitrogen monoxide is being reproduced, right? So if you took this as the first reaction in any sequence, right? When we can clearly see that nitrogen monoxide is acting as a catalyst. Is that visible to everyone? Nitrogen monoxide is clearly acting as a catalyst because nitrogen monoxide can produce nitrogen dioxide and then the nitrogen dioxide can end up producing monoxide back. So the catalyst is regenerated and oxygen atoms, which can then produce ozone. Okay. On the other hand, dioxide is also acting as a catalyst because dioxide can produce, dioxide can produce monoxide and oxygen atoms and then the dioxide can be regenerated. And again, those oxygen atoms can react with the molecules to form ozone. So dioxide is also acting as a catalyst. Okay, so they're both acting as catalysts. So the answer over here is D. The point over here is that these two reactions can happen in any order. Because NO and NO2 are both present in the lower atmosphere as pollutants. So you could either have NO2 making NO and oxygen. And then you could have NO2 being regenerated, right? You could have NO2 first decomposing and then NO2 being regenerated, or you could have it the other way around. You could have NO reacting first and then NO2, and then NO2 forming NO and O, right? So either of these two are possible in either order because they're both present in the lower atmosphere. Remember, a catalyst is going to be present at the beginning of the reaction sequence, okay? Over here at the beginning, they're both present. If only one of them was present at the beginning, then only one of them would act as a catalyst. But since they're both present at the beginning, that means either of them can react first. And therefore, either of them can act as catalysts. So they're both acting as catalysts. All right. So a mixture of two period three oxides is added to water. Okay. A solution forms with a pH of just below seven. What could be the constituents of the mixture? Now in A, Right, Al2O3 won't dissolve, whereas MgO will be just above 7, right? It's insoluble, but it forms a slightly basic solution, right? Slightly alkaline solution, magnesium hydroxide. So it'll be above 7. In B, it'll be it'll be well above 7. It'll be well above 7 because, because Na2O is strong base, right? And MgO is a strong base. This dissolves completely. So you have a very high pH above 7. So it can't be B. In C, you'll get an acidic solution and you have a base. Right now, if you have a little more of the acid present than the base, if you have a little more of the acid present than the base, then that would mean you get a slightly acidic solution. It is possible. 
It is possible, right? What could be the constituent? So they're talking about possibility here. It is possible we have a little more of the acid and a little less of the base, and we form a pH a solution with pH just below 7, right? So the answer here is C. Okay. On the other hand, if you have a little more, if you have a little more base, if you have a little more base and a little more, little less acid, then it'll be just above 7. So you can have these in unequal amounts, right? Whereas D will be well below 7 because they're both acidic. So they'll both especially SO3, right? It'll form sulfuric acid, so it'll be well below 7. So it's not D either. Okay. Which statement about the compounds of the group 2 metals is correct? The answer over here is B, right? Barium sulfate is less soluble than magnesium sulfate. We know the solubility of the sulfates decreases down the group. Okay. Barium carbonate is more thermally stable than strontium carbonate. So this is incorrect. It's not less thermally stable. Calcium hydroxide is more soluble because hydroxide solubility increases down the group. And calcium nitrate is less thermally stable than strontium nitrate. Again, because strontium is lower down the group, it's more thermally stable, right? So calcium nitrate is less thermally stable. A 0 0.005 mole sample of anhydrous calcium carbonate is completely thermally decomposed to give a 100 cm cube of gas. In a separate experiment, Carried out under the exact same conditions, a 0 0.005 mole sample of anhydrous calcium nitrate is completely thermally decomposed. The volume of gaseous products is measured. What total volume of gaseous products is produced from the calcium nitrate? So let's start by writing down the equation for the thermal decomposition. Okay, if you have calcium carbonate forming calcium oxide and carbon dioxide, right? And for the nitrate, for the nitrate, you have calcium nitrate decomposing to form calcium oxide plus 2NO2 plus half O2. Okay. Now, the idea here is this. First of all, you have 0 0.005 moles of this. So in both experiments, you're using 0 0.005 moles. Right? In, both, in both cases, you're using 0 0.005 moles of carbonate and nitrate, right? In experiment one and two respectively now they're saying we produced 100 cm cube of gas 100 cm cube of gas right now what's the molar ratio between the solid over here and the gas over here for every mole of solid for every mole of solid we're producing one mole of carbon dioxide so that means if i have 0 0.005 moles of the solid how many moles of gas do i have i have 0 0.005 moles of gas right for every for if I, for every mole of solid, I have one mole of gas. So for 0 0.005 moles of solid, I have 0 0.005 moles of gas. Now, under the same conditions, one mole of any gas will occupy the same volume. So for example, at room temperature, two gases will both occupy 24 decimeter cube. At a higher temperature, they'll both occupy a higher volume, but it'll be equal. Now, if I have over here, if I had one mole of solid, if I had one mole of solid in the case of the nitrate, how many moles of gas would I produce? If I have one mole of solid, how many moles of gas would I produce? I would produce two moles of nitrogen dioxide and half a mole of oxygen. So one mole of solid gives me 2.5 moles of gas. So if I have the same amount of solid, if I have the same amount of solid, I'm going to produce 2.5 times as much gas. Remember the volume ratios for gases, the volume ratios for gases are the same as the molar ratio, right? So for example, in the first case, one mole solid gives me one mole gas okay in the second case one mole solid gives me 2.5 moles gas and we're using the same amount of solid in both so that means we're going to produce 2.5 times the volume of gas so the answer here is d if you're producing 2.5 times as many moles you're producing 2.5 times the volume okay hence 250 cm cube redox reactions are common in the chemistry of group 17 elements which statement is correct? Bromide ions will reduce chlorine but not iodine. Is that true? That is true, right? We know chlorine is a much stronger oxidizing agent than bromine. So chlorine can oxidize bromide or bromide can reduce chlorine but not iodine. Iodine is not a strong enough oxidizing agent. So the answer over here is A. Okay. If you look at, if you guys remember for halogens, for halogens, right? The strongest oxidizing agent of the three is chlorine and the weakest is iodine. So here the oxidizing strength, strength decreases, okay, decreases down the group, okay. 
and you can verify chlo chlorine will oxidize both so it's b can't be correct okay chlorine will oxi oxidize both okay fluorine is not the weakest out of this four so that's not correct and iodide ions are the strongest reducing agents okay so that's incorrect for the halides it's the opposite trends for the halides is the opposite trend right if you look at these guys over here right iodide is the strongest reducing agent reducing strength of the halides increases down the group okay for the halogens the oxidizing strength decreases so the answer over here is simply a okay silver chloride and silver iodide form equilibria when added to water each equilibrium position lies well to the left Silver iodide will not dissolve in aqueous ammonia. Silver chloride will dissolve in aqueous ammonia and other equilibrium is formed. The position of this equilibrium lies to the right. What is the order of magnitude for these three equilibrium constants? Now, of course, these two lie well to the left and this one lies well to the right. So in the third case, we know that we have way more products. In the third case, we know we have way more products. In the third case, products are relatively higher, right? So that means K3 definitely is the largest. K3 is definitely the largest because the equilibrium lies well to the right. Remember, Kc is products over reactants. More products means higher equilibrium constant, right? More products at equilibrium. So this is to the right. So therefore, K3 is the largest. So that leaves us with C or D, right? A and B are incorrect. K3 has to be the largest. Now, if you look at the equilibrium for chloride and iodide, which of them, which of them is less soluble? Iodide is less soluble. So then for the for which of these two and chloride is more soluble? So for which of these two does the equilibrium lie more to the left? It lies to the left in both. So for which of these is it more to the left? If iodide is less soluble, that means there's more iodide solid present. There's more iodide solid present. Right? So equilibrium K2 lies well more to the left than K1. So that means that K2 must be lesser than K1. Since chloride is more soluble. Since chloride is more soluble, right, it means that we form more aqueous ions with chloride than we do with iodide. If we have more aqueous ions with chloride, we have more products. So K1 would be larger than K2. So then the order that we have is K2 is less than K1, which is less than K3. So the smallest is K2 and the largest is K3. So the answer is C. So question number 17 says, X is the ion of a metal which burns with a red flame. Y is an ion that reacts with concentrated H2SO4 to produce H2S. What could be the formula of the compound containing X and Y? Now, as far as burning with a red flame is concerned, as far as burning with a red flame is concerned, it could either be calcium or strontium. Okay, calcium burns with a red flame and strontium burns with a crimson flame. A crimson, crimson is basically a very dark, deep red color. Okay, so they're both, they can both be called a red flame. This is a much, much more redder flame, I guess you could say, or much more rich red flame okay, for strontium. Y reacts with H2SO4 to produce H2S. So then what ion is Y? What ion is able to reduce sulfur from plus 6 to minus 2? Y must be iodide ions, right? So you have a combination. You have a combination of either calcium and strontium with iodide. So what's the answer? So the answer over here is D, right? Here, X was strontium and Y was iodide. And the formula of the compound is strontium iodide. Oxides of nitrogen are present in the environment due to natural and man-made sources. Which row is correct? What's a natural source of nitrogen oxides? So what's a natural way in which this nitrogen-nitrogen triple bond is broken? Uh, broken? What's a natural way in which we can break this NN triple bond? Now, in, in, naturally, in the environment, lightning can provide enough energy to break this NN triple bond. Okay, so electrical discharge in the atmosphere, aka lightning, can cause this triple bond to break. Okay, and result in nitrogen reacting with oxygen. And in man made sources, internal combustion engines provide a high enough heat for the NN triple bond to break and nitrogen to react with oxygen. Okay, for nitrogen to react, you need a very high activation energy because it has a very strong bond. Lightning or engines with a lot of heat can both provide that. Magnesium hydroxide dissolves in aqueous ammonium chloride, but not in aqueous sodium chloride. Which statement explains this observation? 
why does the hydroxide dissolve in ammonium chloride but not in sodium chloride what's the difference between the two the difference between them is we have the ammon we have ammonium over here and we have sodium over here so what's the difference how do they react differently Ammonium ions are acidic, right? They can react with hydroxide. Ammonium ions can react with the hydroxide ions because they're proton donors, right? They can react with the hydroxide to form NH3 and H2O, right? So you have a neutralization reaction. You have an acid-base reaction between ammonium chloride and magnesium hydroxide. You don't have that with sodium chloride. So because you have an acid-base reaction, ammonium chloride can dissolve magnesium hydroxide. So the answer over here is D right ammonium can act as an acid it's, it's a proton donor it can act as an acid and therefore hydroxides accept that proton and form h2o okay the formula of hydrocortisone acetate is shown which row is correct the number of carbon atoms in one molecule and the number of chiral centers in one molecule now if you look at the number of carbon atoms here we have one two Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, and then twenty-three. So we just have to count them. Okay, just have to count them. We have a total of twenty-three carbon atoms. So it's definitely not A or B, right? Now, how many chiral centers do we have? So the way I've numbered them, this is just random. I've randomly numbered them just to count them, right? Is carbon num are any of the unsaturated carbons chiral centers? Obviously not, right? So we can eliminate those. None of the unsaturated ones are chiral, right? They have to be saturated for them to be chiral, right? So that's not it. Now, this guy, any of the CH2s, are they chiral or the CH3s? No, right? So let's see. Is this one chiral? This one? No. What about this one? Carbon number six. Is this chiral? We have one, two, three, four, right? So we have one chiral center, right? These CH2s again aren't chiral. What about this one and this one? These two over here. Are they chiral? One, two, three, and then a hydrogen. So we have four different groups. So these two are also chiral, right? And that's three so far. What about this one? Again, yes, right? Because you have four different groups, a hydrogen in these three groups, right? This CH2 isn't again, right? Then we have this guy and we have this guy, right? And we have this guy over here. So then how many chiral centers do we have in total? We have four, five, six, seven. So the answer over here is C. Bromomethane decomposes in the stratosphere, forming methyl free radicals and bromine free radicals. Which row correctly describes this decomposition? So they're saying that bromomethane, CH3Br, forms CH3 radicals and Br radicals. Right? Br radicals are just bromine atoms. So, what type of bond fission is taking place? Is this homolytic fission or heterolytic fission? One electron is going to each in this bond one electron is going to each species in this bond one electron is going to the ch3 and one electron is going to the bromine right so this is homolytic fission it's equal bond breaking right one electron goes to each so it's homolytic and how many electrons do we have in a bromine free radical that is a bromine atom right a bromine free radical is just a bromine atom so how many electrons do we have a bromine atom has proton number 35. So it has 35 protons. And since the bromine radical is neutral, it's just a bromine atom, right? We have 35 protons and 35 electrons. So the answer over here is A. Okay. Structural and stereoisomerism should be taken into account when answering this question. Why is a gaseous hydrocarbon which decolorizes aqueous bromine? It contains no rings. 10 grams of Y occupies a volume of 3.43 decimeter cube under room conditions. How many isomeric structures are possible for Y? All right, so let's solve this question over here, right? So this is the question that we have. 
first of all, of course, we know that we have a carbon-carbon double bond, right? Because it decolorizes aqueous bromine. So we know that we have a carbon-carbon double bond, right? Now, can we find the number of moles of Y based on the information given to us? Yes, we can. We know that one mole occupies 24 decimeter cube, right? We know that the number of moles, the, the volume is the number of moles times 24. One mole occupies 24 decimeter cube. So over here, the volume given to us is 3.43 decimeter cube. So then what's the number of moles? What's the number of moles over here? We get 0 0.1429 moles. Okay, so that's the number of moles that we have. That is the number of moles that we have, right? Can we figure out the molar mass? We know that the number of moles is equal to the mass divided by the molar mass. So the molar mass is simply the mass divided by the number of moles, right? The mass given to us is 10 grams, right? The mass given to us is 10 grams. And the molar mass, or the number of moles, sorry, is 0 0.1429. So the molar mass comes out to 69.9. So that's the molar mass, roughly 70, right? The MR is roughly 70. Okay. So we have an MR of 70. Now we know we have a hydrocarbon CXHY. So what's the molecular formula for this? We have a hydrocarbon here. So what's the molecular formula? How many carbon atoms do we have in an alkene? We must have C5H10, right? 5 times 12 is 60 plus 10 is 70. We can't have, we have to have 5 carbon atoms and therefore 10 hydrogen atoms, right? So this is our, this is our molecular formula. So now the question is basically, how many isomeric alkenes do we have that has the molecular formula C5H10? How many possible alkenes have the molecular formula C5H10? H10. That's what the question is asking. Okay, so let's draw this. Now we need to figure out the total number of isomers here, but let's start with the structural isomers first and then figure out for which of these structural isomers we have stereoisomerism. To start with the structural isomers, we're first going to figure out straight chain alkenes and then we're going to look at the branched ones. The first possibility that we have for a straight chain alkene over here is pent 1ene. Here, the carbon carbon double bond is on carbon number 1. I'm not showing the CH bonds over here. The other possibility that we have over here is pent 2-ene, right, in the straight chain. Now, it can go here or here. The double bond can go on one or two, one or two. And we also need to figure out which of these structures exhibit stereoisomerism. We know pent 1-ene does not show stereoisomerism. Since we have a CH2, we have two identical hydrogen atoms. Whereas pent 2-ene does show stereoisomerism. Specifically, it shows cis-trans isomerism. The reason why is because each of the carbon atoms is bonded to a hydrogen and an alkyl group. So then we can say we have a total of three straight chain isomers with this molecular formula. We have pent-1-ene, we have cis-pent-2-ene, and we have trans-pent-2-ene. Okay. Now, what if you had a single branch? What if you had a single branch, right? So now let's look at one branch. Now, one possibility that we have over here is we have a carbon-carbon double bond, carbon 1, and we have a methyl group on carbon number 2. So what we have over here is we have 2-methyl but-1-ene, and this does not show cis-trans isomerism since we have a CH2 here. We have two identical hydrogen atoms in this carbon, right? The other possibility is but-1-ene, but the methyl group on carbon number 3 instead of carbon number 2, right? This also doesn't show cis-trans isomerism, again, because we have a CH2. We could also have the carbon-carbon double bond on carbon number 2. In this case, we have the branch here or here. So we get 2-methyl-butuene, which doesn't show cis-trans either, because we have two methyl groups here. Right? So there's three possibilities with a single branch. You can, have, you can have the main chain four carbon atoms with alkene on carbon number 1, in which case the methyl can go to carbon 2 or carbon 3. Or you can have alkene on carbon 2, in which case the methyl will also be on carbon number 2. So there's three possibilities with a single branch. Okay. Are there any possibilities with the double branch? Are there any possibilities with a double branch? Is this possible? It's not possible because we can't have a carbon-carbon double bond anymore because this carbon is already bonded to four carbons. Right? So there's no double bond possible here because a carbon can't make five bonds. So the double branch is not possible. So either we have straight chains or we have a single branch. Okay, with straight chain we have, so the possibilities that we have over here are pent-1-ene, cis-pent-2-ene, trans-pent-2-ene, right? 2-methyl-but-1-ene, 3-methyl-but-1-ene, and 
2 methyl but 2 in. Okay, so total possibilities over here are 6. So the answer over here is C, right? We have a total of 6 isomeric products that meet these conditions. Which equation represents a valid propagation step in the chlorination of ethane? Propagation is when, first of all, a radical and a molecule combine to give you another radical and a molecule. So that definitely rules out D because D is a termination step, right? D is a termination step. Now, which of these is a valid, valid propagation step? First of all, do we have any H radicals? Do we have any H radicals over the course of the reaction being formed or reacting? No, right? We don't. In free radical substitution, we never have hydrogen radicals forming or reacting in any propagation step or any step at all. So the answer must be A, right? This is a possible propagation step in the chlorination of ethane. This is when you're having dye substitution. This is after the first substitution has already taken place. Okay. Butanoic acid can be made from one bromopropane in two stages. In the first stage, one bromopropane can be converted into butane nitrile. In the second stage, the butane nitrile can be converted to a carboxylic acid. What types of reactions are stage one and two? So what is stage one? When bromine is substituted by CN, right? Halogenoalkanes undergo nucleophilic substitution. All right. And then the second reaction, when nitriles are converted to carboxylic acids, this type of a reaction is called a hydrolysis reaction, right? This is a hydrolysis reaction. Okay, so stage two is hydrolysis. So the answer over here is C. A halogenoalkane has the molecular formula C5H11Br. The halogenoalkane does not form an alkene when treated with ethanolic sodium hydroxide. What could be the halogenoalkane? So it does not form an alkene when treated with ethanolic sodium hydroxide. It does not undergo elimination. What that means is that the carbon with the bromine, the neighboring carbon has no hydrogen atoms. The neighboring carbon has no hydrogen atoms. Okay, so this carbon has is bonded to zero hydrogen atoms, right? This carbon is not bonded to any hydrogen atoms. So which one is this? Remember, for elimination to take place, the neighboring carbon has to have a hydrogen. Here, obviously, we can see that the neighboring carbon does not have a hydrogen. So then this is, we have the main chain is propane. We have one bromo, two, two dimethyl propane. Okay, one bromo, one bromo, two, two dimethyl propane. So the answer over here is D. Question number 26. Compound P is heated under reflux with an excess of acidified potassium dichromate 6 to form compound Q. Compound Q has a lower boiling point than compound P. What could be compound P? Now over here we're starting with an alcohol. We're starting with an alcohol. So our, if we heat the alcohol under reflux, we oxidize it. The product, the product could be an acid or a ketone, right? If it was a primary alcohol, if it was a primary alcohol, we'd get a carboxylic acid. If it was a secondary alcohol, we'd have a ketone. Which of them would have a lower boiling point than the initial reactant? Would a carboxylic acid have a lower boiling point than a primary alcohol? Would a carboxylic acid have a lower boiling point than the primary alcohol that made it? No, right? Carboxylic acids can make hydrogen bonds even more hydrogen bonds than alcohol. So acids, acids have higher boiling points than alcohols, right? When we talk about the boiling point, acids have higher boiling points than alcohol, whereas ketones have lower boiling points. Ketones have lower boiling points. So that means that, that compound Q must be a ketone. So compound P must be what kind of alcohol then? Compound P must be what kind of alcohol then? Compound P must be a secondary alcohol. So the answer over here is D. Okay, pentan 2 all is a secondary alcohol. Okay, this is tertiary, this is primary, this is primary. Okay, this is one primary alcohol, this is a tertiary alcohol, and this is a primary alcohol. This doesn't undergo oxidation, and A and C will produce acids. So the answer over here is D. Structural and stereoisomerism should be taken into account when answering this question. An organic compound X is dehydrated by heating with concentrated phosphoric acid. Only two organic products are formed. What could be X? Now, if we dehydrate compound A, 
Remember, when we dehydrate, we're removing the OH group and the hydrogen from a neighboring carbon. We're removing the OH and the hydrogen from a neighboring carbon. Does it matter if I remove this one or this one, or are they identical? These two hydrogen atoms. We have a symmetry through this carbon atom, right? So these two hydrogen atoms are identical. Doesn't matter if I remove this one or this one, I'll get the same products, right? Now, if I remove this hydrogen, what do I end up making? I end up making this guy, right? Three, four, five. Right, I end up making this guy. Now, my question is, does this alkene that I've produced, does it show cis-trans isomerism? Right, I have a one, two, three, four, five carbon alkene. My question is, does it show cis-trans isomerism? Yes. So I'm either producing the trans isomer, right, or I'm producing the, or I'm producing the cis isomer. Right? So what I have over here is I have trans pentuene or cis pentuene as my two possibilities. Right? Doesn't matter if I remove this hydrogen or this one, I'll produce pentuene. But pentuene can be either cis pentuene or trans pentuene. So I'm only producing two products here. So the answer over here is A. Two organic products are formed cis and trans pentuene. Which compound produces a precipitate with 2 4 DNPH and also with alkaline aqueous iodine? So now remember for 2,4-DNPH, we, we need a carbonyl compound. And for alkaline aqueous iodine, we need a CH3CO, okay? So either we need this, right? Alkaline aqueous iodine can, can take place with this guy as well. But this guy doesn't have, this guy over here doesn't have, it doesn't have what? It doesn't have the, it doesn't have the 2,4-DNPH, right? It doesn't have a carbonyl carbon. So it has to be something that has this group. So then which one is it then for sure? It has to be C, right? If you look at butanone, butanone has this structure. Butanone has CH3, C double bond O, and then CH2, CH3, right? So we have this, we have the 2,4-DNPH, that's the orange precipitate, and we also have alkaline aqueous iodine, because we have the CH3CO. And so the answer is C. Organic compound Z has an alcohol group and a carboxylic acid group. Compound Z reacts with magnesium carbonate to make a salt with a relative formula mass of 230.3. Compound Z does not react with acidified potassium manganate 7. What could be the identity of compound Z? So first my question is what type of an alcohol does compound Z have if it does not undergo oxidation at all? We know, we know alcohols will undergo oxidation but this alcohol isn't undergoing oxidation. So that means this alcohol has to be a tertiary alcohol. It has to be a tertiary alcohol. It does not undergo oxidation. So that means the carbon atom with the alcohol is already bonded to three carbon atoms, right? So the methyl group, methyl group and the hydroxy group are on the same carbon. So that leaves us with options A and B. It leaves us with options A and B. The hydroxy and the methyl group are on the same carbon, right? They're both on carbon number two. And now given this, right, we can either have, we can either have this as our product or we can have, or as our reactant, sorry, or we can have this guy, right? We can have a five carbon compound or a four carbon compound. Now in this guy, when it reacts with magnesium carbonate, right, we end up making this. We have CH3 twice, C, OH, right? And then we have CO2 minus right and we're going to need two of these we're going to need two of these for every magnesium ion right since this has a one minus charge in the salt we're going to need two of these what is the mass of this guy over here what is the mass of this guy this salt the relative formula mass for this salt can someone tell me we have two ch3 so that's two times 15 right plus 12 for the carbon plus the OH group, which is 17, plus the CO2 minus, which is 44, right? All of that will be multiplied by 2, plus the mass of magnesium. So that will be 24.3. This mass comes out to 230.3. So is that the answer then? It must be this one, right? 230.3. So this is what? Which one is it? Is it A or B? Propanoic acid or butanoic acid, the main chain. We have a three carbon chain. So it is two methyl, it is two hydroxy, two methyl propanoic acid, right? 
2 hydroxy 2 methyl propanoic acid so the answer here is b okay the infrared spectrum of y is shown what could y be now if you look at the table right what we see is we see this absorption, the very characteristic absorption due to the OH group from an alcohol, right? Hydroxy group, 3200 to 3600, around 3400 wave numbers. So we know that this is an OH from alcohol, right? It's a hydroxy group. All right. And we know that this is obviously the CH, right? This is CH. And do we see any C double bond O over here? Do we see any C double bond O over here around 1700? Is there any C double bond O? No, right? There's no C double bond O present. So that means we have an alcohol, but we don't. We have an OH group, okay, from the alcohol, but we have no C double bond O group present. So we can clearly see that it can't be A because A is an ester. It has a C double bond O and it doesn't have an OH group, okay? It could be B. It definitely isn't C because we don't have a C double bond O and it's not D either. So the answer must be B, okay? The answer must be B, okay? Because only B has an OH group and doesn't have a C double bond O. And we can also see that, we can also see that this guy over here has an absorption around 1500, right? 1500 to 1680 for the carbon-carbon double bond, right? So the answer over here is B.